Let's go to Washington and speak to Barry Pavel, who's the senior vice president and director of the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security at the Atlantic Council. Barry, thank you so much indeed for your time. Are we now at a it's point that these two countries together, obviously driven by these two leaders, can affect real change to the existing world order? Well, I think, I think we're seeing that happening, yes. And I think this is a long-term trend. So let's kind of uh, rewind a little bit. Uh, the growth of China's economy is a sustained effort. And that economy is now on a par with uh, or close to that of the number one economy of the United States. So that's a long-term trend. The other trend to take account of is when Xi Jinping became the leader of China, he took China in a very different direction than his predecessors. He's clamping down at home. He's being openly aggressive overseas. You know, numerous uh, aircraft incursions into Taiwanese airspace, for example, disputes with numerous, numerous borders, clamping down on Hong Kong despite the agreement, et cetera. We also see a long-term trend from Russia, 2008, invasion of Georgia to keep it anchored with Russia, a frozen conflict. 2014, the invasion and illegal annexation of Crimea in Ukraine, uh, keeping Ukraine tethered to Russia and out of, you know, natural sovereign um, desires to integrate with Western economic and other structures. Additional invasion in eastern Ukraine in the Donbas and Luhansk, where that continues today, again, a frozen conflict. And now a crisis a European crisis, if not a global crisis, soon, completely instigated by the unprecedented buildup of Russian forces uh, around the borders of a sovereign country, Ukraine. That sovereign country isn't perfect, but there's no reason to use military coercion to, uh, to deny it the normal um, rights and privileges of a nation state, which has been the core of the international system since the 1648 Treaty of Westphalia. Yeah. So those are the I mean, long-term okay. trends, and you, I think they're coming to a head. Yeah, uh, I like the fact that you've gone back centuries, because I only wanted to go back half a century, and it's 50 years ago, <laughs> isn't it, this month, that Richard Nixon went to China, and that trip kind of set a pattern of relations between Washington and Beijing, which have undoubtedly changed. And when you have Beijing almost reducing everything, at least in Asia, to a zero-sum game and saying to countries, you're either with us or against us, and then you bring in the theory of the rise and fall of the great empires. Is America weakened in terms of China's rise in Asia? And can it really counter Beijing when you consider that, look, many people are saying around the world, the U.S. isn't what it used to be? Well, of course, um, if you talk about relative power, the growth of the Chinese economy is a noteworthy trend. And by the way, this was a direct result of the U.S.-led international system since the end of World War II where um, unprecedented uh, stability that allowed uh, China, not just allowed, but was encouraged by American decision makers, uh, were on the mistaken assumption that as, as China's economy grew, it would open up, it would reform its political system and wouldn't suppress uh, its people from having normal, uh, the normal rights of people in free societies everywhere. That assumption was proven very wrong by Xi Jinping's assumption of leadership 10 years ago. And so that is where things are diverging. Xi Jinping is being much more aggressive overseas. Um, the U.S. Um, has like-minded allies in both Asia and Europe. We're together because of sovereign decisions again. And so these allies have decided, OK, now we have two great powers who are really throwing their weight around. So you're also seeing increasing groupings of these democracies, the AUKUS Treaty, uh, lots more sort of Indo-Pacific as well as European groupings to get together to try to work together, consult, and deal with the aggression uh, that's coming from these authoritarian powers, Russia and China. You mentioned Ukraine, of course, Barry. What realistically can Vladimir Putin hope to get from Xi Jinping, apart from saying, look, at least I have a friend here who's got the world's biggest military and the world's biggest navy, not necessarily that China will intervene militarily, but does he just want to show that he has friends? I think it's really, yeah, just a, a sort of thin diplomatic um, uh, cover. I, uh, my guess is the only cost of that for 
uh, Vladimir Putin will be Xi Jinping's request, uh, and this is speculation, you know, please don't do this during my Olympics, uh, which extends for another uh, several weeks. Of course, because they're not uh, open countries, you won't see a, a full press statement, <laughs> um, you know, that goes into these kinds of issues. But uh, my guess is that's the only price that Xi Jinping will exact. But, uh, it, you know, so Russia is on its own overall. But I think uh, Russia has some options now. It has an enormous forces poised on the border of a sovereign European state. And it, it might keep those forces there for a little bit and continue to seek to extract concessions from uh, European and American leaders to try to get what it wants, which is a sphere of influence, which goes back to a 20th century concept where uh, one country can rule over another just because it's in its neighborhood and because it can use its military. That's not the way the world should work. Barry, thank you so much indeed. Really, really appreciate the analysis. Barry Pavel in Washington.